no one is going to force you to be happy against your will or anything like this. But at the moment, misery and malaise are coercive, whereas in future, yeah, essentially you're going to be able to choose your own hedonic range and hedonic set point. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you're listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week, our guest is British transhumanist David Pierce, who was one of the co-founders of the World Transhumanist Association, which has since been rebranded as Humanity Plus. Now, in addition to being on the front lines of the early transhumanist movement, David is also quite well known for his active work on what he calls the hedonistic imperative, which seeks to use genetic engineering and nanotechnology to abolish suffering in all sentient life. Obviously, this is a very bold agenda, and through this conversation, I try to push David on the many nuances and challenges that are inherent in this goal. Along the way, we explore the fundamental questions of transhumanism, whether we'll ever upload our consciousness into machines, the dangers of giving humans, who are quite well known for addiction, control over their own neurotransmitters, questions around regulation, whether suffering is necessary for appreciating life, and so much more around these issues. It was an incredibly fascinating conversation, as it's clear that David is truly passionate about this mission. And so without further delay, let's jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the Feedback Loop, David Pierce. Well, why don't we just go ahead and start by jumping into, I think, what any good philosophical conversation usually requires, which is defining things. So maybe just to start, as someone who has really led the charge on transhumanism, maybe you could just define for everybody what you think, You could, maybe you could just define transhumanism and maybe talk a little bit about what attracted you to the field. There is no universally agreed definition of transhumanism, which is very much work in progress. Uh, Sometimes, simplistically, I define transhumanism in terms of the three supers, that is super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. And I think our long-term goal as a civilization should be work fulfillment of the three supers. But yeah, each of these terms needs unpacking. Uh, Super happiness, relatively straightforward, one might imagine. This is the idea. It's my core focus that we can replace our traditional biology of pain and pleasure with a novel architecture of mind, life based entirely on information sensitive gradients of well being. And if Uh, Traditionally, Darwinian life, human existence has ranged between, let's say, this is rather schematic, minus 10 to zero to plus 10, with minus 10 being abject despair, zero hedonically neutral experience, plus 10 sublime ecstasy. It should be possible to recalibrate the hedonic treadmill, genetically upgrade ourselves to have a civilization initially perhaps uh, uh, plus 10 to plus 30, but eventually perhaps uh, a plus 90 to a plus 100. Um, Much more to be said there. I think we can go back to it. But the other two supers of transhumanism, super longevity. This is the idea that just just as silicon robots can be upgraded and repaired indefinitely. There is no immutable law of nature that says that organic robots have to perish and die. Uh, Transhumanists hope to phase out the biology of aging. But, and this is really important, given that older people at least, and quite possibly two middle-aged people, are not going to make it to the transition. Transhumanists are keen on a fallback strategy of cryonics, maybe even cryothanasia. And I personally think cryonics should be opt out, cryothanasia opt in. 
The third of the three supers, super intelligence. This embraces a whole host of different notions. Uh, conceptions of super intelligence range from uh, the IJ Good Miri Bostrom intelligence explosion. This is the idea that recursively self improving software based AI might go foom, so to speak, a runaway intelligence explosion. And the upshot may be uh, a form of machine super intelligence that is uh, inimical, inimical to human interests. Uh, and the focus of believers in this conception of super intelligence is, yeah, is, is trying to engineer sentience uh, friendly AI. Then, which I need scarcely tell you about, there is the Kurzweilian conception of superintelligence, which just in case uh, anyone doesn't know, envisages essentially a, a fusion between humans and our machines, mind uploading, any distinction between biological and machine in, uh, intelligence will uh, evaporate. Uh, there is another conception of superintelligence, which I confess is closer to my own, which envisages post-human superintelligence as our biological descendants, genetically written, AI augmented, anything uh, narrow superintelligence uh, can do. You can have neurochips, uh, but nonetheless, and this is, I'm a bit out on a limb here, I confess, I don't think classical digital computers can solve the binding problem. I think phenomenal binding is non-classical non-algorithmic, so digital computers are not going to wake up. And I see full spectrum superintelligence is essentially massively augmented versions of ourselves. Uh, it, it, essentially, uh, full spectrum superintelligence will involve a capacity to navigate altered state spaces of consciousness, to mind meld with other uh, sentient beings, uh, a whole raft of things like that. So as we look at those three forms of, or three key components of transhumanism, do you really embrace a transformation of the species to attain those things? Do you like the idea of leaving behind the human form and shifting to something that is more technological, whether that's uploaded consciousnesses, uh, some kind of virtual avatar, whether it's um, more like cyborgs, like you said, with genetics augmented by AI, like what is the direction that you want to see that go? Yeah, I mean, given my views on the nature of phenomenal binding, I don't believe in whole brain emulation, uh, mind uploading. I think classical Turing machines will always be zombies, even if you were fancifully to replace their ones and zeros with discrete pixels of experience, execute the code, all you'll get is a, is a micro experiential zombie. Um, the direction, as I would see it, uh, what is going to be critical is universal access for all prospective parents, pre-implantation genetic screening, counseling, uh, CRISPR genome editing. Uh, it's pr probably going to be technically easier to regulate pain thresholds, hedonic range and hedonic set points, recalibrating the hedonic treadmill than it is to for example, uh, give everyone super genius genomes. It, it would in theory be possible to uh, achieve biological super intelligence in a century or two. I think this would, for example, if one were to uh, clone von Neumann a few hundred times, he's buried at uh, uh, Princeton with a few genetic tweaks hothouse the products and in a recursive cycle of self-improvement with AI augmentation. I think that would be one strategy to get biological superintelligence. But in terms of ordinary mortals, so to speak, it's not just a matter of prospective parents. Uh, uh, whereas there is a, a volume knob for pain, the FCN9A gene, there is no volume knob for intellig uh, intelligence. Um, but yeah, uh, given that my focus is the problem of suffering, getting rid of mental and physical 
pain. I think the priority and our obligation to future generations is to ensure that they aren't genetically predestined to suffer like us. And tweaking even a handful of genes, I mentioned STN9A, the volume knob for pain. I could have said something like the far and far out gene which uh, confer uh, protection against uh, anxiety disorders, depression, and once again, uh, 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 pain. Uh, yeah, I think it should be possible uh, to ratchet up well-being. I think probably, I mean, many of your listeners will be thinking, well, a number of things. All the ways everything could go wrong, and they are absolutely legion, but nonetheless, Every single kid born today is a unique, untested genetic experiment. And most people consider uh, this form of, of you know, genetic experimentation is ethically permissible. And in consequence, they bring more life and more suffering into the world. Uh, but I think, yeah, that we have an obligation to load the genetic dice in favor of our kids. But yeah, basic principle, upgrading uh, our... Uh, our reward circuitry, upgrading our genomes together with evolution in AI. Neuralink is clearly just a, a foretaste. Everything that uh, essentially narrow AI can do, you'll be able to do with, with, with neurochips. Uh, as I said, I'm not, I don't go personally go down the full Kurtzweilian fusion uh, fusion uh, 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 route and I think uh, yeah essentially this is going to take many uh, many centuries but... do you do you envision people in 10 to 20 years maybe using something like a neural link like a neural interface to gain control directly over their hormones and the neurotransmitters where they can actually in the moment, live change the levels of dopamine or other uh, chemicals going through their body? Yes, I mean, there's going to be uh, immense improvements in user interfaces uh, too. So it's going to become much, much uh, friendlier. Uh, clearly, there are going to be developments in designer drugs too. Um, I can give a, give a few examples. Uh, but as we all know, even, uh, well, uh, wonder drugs have endless, uh, endless pitfalls, and it would be far better if our default settings or the default settings of new life were such that, yeah, everyone essentially born into the world had an extremely high hedonic set point, an extremely high uh, pain threshold. In terms of uh, designer drugs, and this is this is just an example. As is well known, today's existing antidepressants are lame. Yes, they do help uh, a large a large minority of people, but depression is woefully undertreated and badly treated. Uh, hundreds of millions of people worldwide are clinically or subclinically depressed. Uh, and one of the reasons for the fact that so many people, including people who don't actually have a, a clinical diagnosis of depression, uh, one of the reasons is that the neurotransmitter system most directly implicated in hedonic tone is the opioid system. And as we know, although uh, new opioid drugs very reliably lift mood, it's quite impossible responsibly to urge anyone, even someone who is severely depressed, to take opioids. Now, what if there were some way to actually recalibrate the hedonic treadmill so that native opioid function were actually uh, uh, elevated? Uh, and very interesting discovery uh, last year, the role of the ACKR three receptor in the central nervous system and its role seems to be an opioid scavenger. And by blocking the ACKR3 receptor, uh, it's possible to elevate endogenous opioids. And in principle, at any rate, one could use either gene therapy 
or the right designer drugs to elevate native opioid function. However, very early days yet. The history of psychopharmacology is littered with false dawns. Even if a drug appears to have relatively limited abuse potential, one shouldn't underestimate the, the, poten the potential of some people to do stupid things, which is why in spite of uh, exciting developments in psychopharmacology, I think our long-term goal as a species should be to try to uh, improve default settings. Mm. Uh, and before going on to the really radical transhumanist stuff, let alone the kind of post-human civilization animated by gradients of superhuman bliss. And yeah, this I think should be our ethical pr priority. At times I sound like uh, a biotechnological determinist. It's all genes, 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 and biology. Clearly it's not. Uh, we need yeah, a fairer society, universal basic income, a healthcare, I, an enormous shopping list I could give you of all the ways that the world needs improving. But unless we're prepared to tackle the biological genetic roots of pain and suffering, it will continue indefinitely. Well, now the question that I'm sure you get all the time when you talk about this uh, and most people's concern do you think this would run into a situation like uh, the rats who have cocaine in their water where they just constantly sip away at the cocaine until they die and they forget about connecting with other humans or eating or anything like that? Like, do we run into uh, a, how, how do we, I guess, stop ourselves from just using drugs until we die if we're able to control our pleasure um, and, and to that extent? Why not, yeah, completely max out when, when, when we do gain full mastery of the pleasure pain access and, uh, and can get rid of experience below hedonic zero, why not, yeah, just absolutely max out. Um, a society of, so to speak, wireheads, that wireheading, you may recall, this comes from the discovery by Olds and Milner back in 1954 of what were then called uh, the pleasure centers, the mesolimbic dopamine system. In fact, they're better called the desire centers, but yes, uh, a rat or a monkey or a relevant human will go on pressing the lever indefinitely because wireheading is more rewarding than food or sex. However, this isn't a viable model for the future of civilization because clearly wireheads don't want to raise baby wireheads. So there would be selection pressure against any predisposition to do so. And there I think uh, more sophisticated analogs of wireheading should be offered to victims, let's say of an intractable pain or depression it's, it's, it's not the way forward for society and civilization. But by uh, ratcheted, ratcheting up genetically hedonic set points and hedonic range, uh, you can circumvent these problems. And particularly with a bioconservative audience, it's really, yeah, it's really important to stress that it's, though it might sound alien, hedonic recalibration is just your waking up in the morning in an extremely good mood. Uh, in practice, of course, uh, a world in which world animated by information sensitive gradients of well being, there will be a great uh, shift uh, in values and the kind of things we do. But no one need fear that something they, uh, they particularly value or, or treasure, that this will disappear simply in virtue of having their hedonic uh, set point elevated. Uh, sometimes I forget to stress that this, this should be done, that realistically, this is going to be voluntary. No one is going to force you to be happy against your will or anything like this. But at the moment, misery and malaise are coercive. Whereas in future, yeah, essentially, you're going to be able to choose your own hedonic range and hedonic set point. But uh, if one takes the World Health, Defi Health Organization definition of health seriously, 
as set out in its founding constitution, health is a, is a, uh, is a state of complete physical, emotional, and social well-being. That's jaw-droppingly ambitious. The only way to, uh, to get everyone healthy, all our kids healthy, is to do some genetic tweaking. And in some ways, the transhumanist conception of health is less ambitious. I don't think, at least until the very far future, we should aim for complete well-being. I think we should aim for information-sensitive gradients of well-being. Do you think the insane backlash that has taken place around the COVID vaccine in particular suggests that people are ready for something like this? Because it seems like the, the COVID vaccine in a lot of ways is kind of a testament to science and its ability to potentially end a form of suffering and pain and, and even death. And yet it seems a, there's a non-significant amount of people or a non-insignificant amount of people who are absolutely against the vaccine in every way, shape and form. Yes, and this is the reason that rather than being able to tell a happy Kurtzweilian story of uh, getting rid of suffering this century or even a hundred year plan, I fear centuries of pain and suffering, needless pain and suffering still lie ahead before we can get rid of it altogether. But nonetheless, in spite of the vaccine skeptics and the vaccine critics, most of the world uh, is keen to get vaccinated. Uh, and as I said, though the critics have been extremely vocal, uh, COVID and vaccinations against it just show just how much very rapid progress, medical progress is, is possible when a, 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 a consensus is too strong, but something approaching a consensus exists that, uh, yeah, that uh, COVID-19 is, is a terrible disease and we need to fix it. And medical science has risen to the challenge. Sure, the vaccines uh, aren't perfect, but we're learning stuff all the time. Now, imagine if it were possible to rally, and this is sadly is fanciful for the foreseeable future, uh, to rally the world around the WHO conception of health. Uh, yeah, it would be possible to, yeah, to, to even have a, a, a vaccine for mental health, uh, which uh, I, I mentioned, uh, transthyrethin amyloidosis, treated with this one-off CRISPR injection. Imagine doing the same so you had Jo Cameron's, uh, effectively her far and far out genes, uh, a one-off injection for mental health. I'm glossing over so many complications, it's not true. But nonetheless, later this century and beyond, it's the kind of intervention that will be technically feasible. Uh, and though it's, it's depressing, if one were to just contemplate the amount of indescribable pain and suffering in the world today. I mean, I can, you know, one trots out, you know, these figures like something like 850,000 people each year kill themselves. Uh, hundreds, of, you know, the, the, the level of suffering in terms of untreated pain, untreated depression, mental illness, or simply just run of the mill malaise. It is, it is, is incalculable. So, yeah, part of the job of the transhumanist movement, the effective altruist movement, with which, with which it overlaps, is education, dare one say it, to propaganda. It's, it's a very difficult balance to strike because as soon as one takes on the role of advocate, one abandons the role of researcher or scientist. Uh, and uh, if there were currently global consensus around uh, lifting hedonic set points and hedonic range, I would, you know, be stressing all the kinds of things that could go, that could that, that could go wrong. So it's a very delicate balance to strike, and I don't know, I don't pretend I know what is is what is the right balance. But essentially, we want to convert, I would say, everyone into fanatical life lovers. Yeah, in in my own research, a lot of my 
focus has been on environmental factors that reduce people's happiness. You know, the things like low status that you were talking about before, you, you know, you mentioned subordination and whatnot as uh, drivers of, of depression and anxiety. Um, and, and there seems to be a lot of other things like that noise, uh, urban populations. There's a lot of things that we've seen that evolutionarily are mismatched to our biology and therefore cause a lot of those issues. If we go directly to this kind of focus on, I guess, the fixing the hedonistic set point, are we potentially setting up a situation where we're just happy in a burning world kind of scenario where we we have a lot of environmental factors that are working against us, but we're okay with it because we've got all this good dopamine going through our system? <laughs> Um, intuitively, one might imagine that's a risk, but it's the people who love life most who tend to be involved in institutes for preventing existential risks. It's the activists who tend to have the high hedonic set points and the active citizens. By contrast, it's people who are depressive, who just feel crushed to sometimes engage in reckless, self-destructive behavior. They don't take care of their own uh, nutrition, you know, diet, exercise, sleep discipline. Even uh, if one is focused on the biological genetic, yeah, most people, probably, they don't yet reach their full uh, genetic potential in terms of, of yeah, getting their sleep discipline optimal, nutrition, optimal. Food should be regarded as a very subtle drug, so it's worth uh, treating what you eat with great respect. After all, you know, the, it's cliche, you are what you eat, but yeah, uh, think of the amount of care people take, or most people take, uh, think of the drugs they take. It's the same is, is ideally true with the particular things one chooses to eat, and of course, uh, aerobic exercise. So, uh, yeah, occasionally uh, people get in contact, asking advice, what cocktail of drugs would you recommend? I can, believe it or not, sound a bit like a naturopath when I start trying to find out if they, how, how good is their diet and sleep discipline and so on. So clearly it, it's, it's a multi-track approach involving, you know, all the things that naturopaths tell us together with the social, political, economic reform. The reason in my own work I focused so much on the biological genetic is that it is uh, ne neglected. And if we don't actually focus on genome reform, uh, essentially yeah, pain and suffering will continue indefinitely. And I hope we're not having a similar conversation or rather our counterparts 500 years time why aren't we happy? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and what about regulations in this regard? Um, who, who's going to really drive this innovation? Do you see it being something that is done more by science scientists and research researchers at university? Do you think it's going to be a government funded thing? And then once it's out there in the world, is there any kind of regulation that you foresee would say, all right, you can turn your dopamine up to level eight, but you can't turn it up to 10. We're going to put a restrictor on your um, neural interface, or you can only set your genetic set point so high. Like, do you, I, I imagine somewhere along the line, those conversations have to happen, right? Yes. Uh, though I, yeah, this, this is a difficult one. Um, in the West, it's probably going to be prospective parents who are taking the decisions for their future uh, offspring, but inevitably the medical authorities are going to be involved. But what about the Chinese model? Uh, it's... <sighs> and in the case of China, one suspects that greater priority will be given to ratcheting up intelligence. Uh, it would be nice to think that the overriding priority is the, going to be the subjective well-being of future children and grandchildren, but I suspect the state is going to take a great interest in ways for boosting 
the intellectual performance, probably quite narrowly defined in terms of autistic IQ tests. So yeah, there is going to be regulation. Uh, how it will all play out, I don't pretend uh, to know. Uh, tremendous, tremendous dilemmas there. Uh, part of the role, I think, of bioethicists is to set out what is technically feasible so we can have, have a debate. Uh, I'm not setting out, I'm not, this isn't a five year plan reprogramming sure. the global ecosystem. Do you, do you think that this could potentially create a kind of monochromatic and maybe zombie like world in a sense? Like I, I, I think for instance of yin and yang, um, and how there's no light without dark. And I wonder if there's a potential of losing maybe a sense of gratitude or appreciation of life that uh, is benefited by having suffering and 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 pain you know we ap maybe appreciate the lack of pain or the things that happen in our life after pain more because we went through that struggle do you think we run a risk of of going into that kind of monochromatic world where we don't have that same level of uh, appreciation without the pain? Um, intuitively, one might imagine so, but essentially it's going to be a choice how much hedonic contrast we have. One could have uh, a civilization of, let's say, of, of, uh, that, uh, that lies between plus 10 and plus 30. So immense hedonic uh, contrast. Uh, even though their darkest depths are our, at the level of our peak experiences, there is tremendous hedonic range there. Alternatively, one could have a much narrower hedonic range. Uh, in terms of appreciation, I, I just as tragically there are people who spend their whole lives, almost their whole lives below hedonic zero, chronically depressed and they certainly know they're suffering. Likewise, there are people at the other extreme who go through life gradients of well-being and they may not spend their life counting their blessings, but they have extremely rich lives. Uh, and in terms of being monochrome and diversity, uh, genome editing will actually allow a far greater diversity of experiences than is possible under a regime of natural selection, uh, which uh, natural selection forbids crossing so-called fitness gaps, whereas with genome editing, starting with CRISPR and then going on to base editing, it would be possible to create entirely new default state spaces of of, of, of consciousness. Uh, so uh, rather than being samey and monotonous, I, I think uh, transhumans and certainly full spectrum super intelligences will be able to uh, yeah, explore entire state spaces of consciousness as different as waking from dreaming. Uh, sometimes people say, you know, this example, can't imagine what it's like to be a bat or echolocation. There are billions of possible state spaces that could be explored with the use of biological genetic interventions. Uh, today, it is generally reckless to take psychedelics, but once we have got our reward circuitry sorted out too, it would be possible to combine gene editing with designer psychedelics and a far greater diversity of state spaces of experience. In terms of just the raw intensity of experience, that's likely to be magnified too. In terms of finding life meaningful, although a lot of philosophers have, you know, draw this distinction between uh, happiness and meaning, in practice, Depression, low mood, drains life of meaning, which in the case of severe depression, tails off into just complete nihilism. Whereas as mood is ratcheted up, life seems hyper meaningful. 
So in terms of what life will be like uh, in a transhuman and then a post-human civilization, not merely will it eventually be orders of magnitude happier, but life will seem just self-intimatingly super meaningful and super significant to an extent that is just physiologically impossible today. And on that same note, it gets me thinking about your specific phrasing. You say it's a mouthful, but I think it's really important. It's the information sensitive gradients of bliss. In regards to that, you know, we evolved pain and depression, as you mentioned, as ways to kind of help us survive. They're, they're adaptive. You know, pain tells us where not to go. If we have a broken leg, the pain tells us not to walk on it. Um, it is the information sensitive aspect of, of your theory here. What kind is, is that what helps us keep the information that pain and depression would have provided us without the actual experience of the pain and depression? Yeah, so I want to get rid of the nasty raw feels in that silicon robots can do most. Some people would say all, but I will say this. <laughs> Many of the things that humans can do without the nasty raw feels of uh, pain, suffering, depression, and anxiety. And we need to make the transition to a more civilized signaling system. It would be possible to use neuroprostheses for some functions, uh, but genetic recalibration of hedonic tone and hedonic range will uh, equally serve uh, 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 for many. In practice, it'd be possible uh, uh, to, use, to use both. Um, before, yeah, uh, nociception is, is, is vital. Uh, phenomenal pain is optional. And clearly it's really important to make sure that people avoid noxious physical stimuli. Uh, that people born with congenital insensitivity to pain, they need to lead a, a cotton wool uh, existence. But uh, there are other people for whom you've probably met them. They'll say things like, ah, oh, pain is just a useful signaling mechanism. They've got a very high pain threshold. And there are potential problems here. If, if, if you do have an a extremely high pain threshold, you're likely perhaps to engage in more forms of risky behavior. Uh, on the other hand, the people who love life most tend in other ways to be very risk averse. They are very keen to live as long as possible. So yeah, a thousand and one potential pitfalls before making the transition to a civilization based entirely on gradients of bliss, it makes sense to aim for a hypothymic civilization, as, 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 as I was saying. But uh, yeah, that should be the goal. And though it's, it's, it is a, a tremendous mouthful, yeah, the information sensitive gradients of, of, of bliss are critical too to just behaving uh, in a socially responsible way. Yeah, absolutely. And what are the biggest obstacles uh, that you feel are in our way as a society is the is religion or uh, capitalism or culture in general like are there specific aspects of society you think are really blocking this progress and in, in addition to that what is your focus and, and fight on changing that I think the biggest obstacle of all is status quo bias. I mean, yes, there is obviously tremendous uh, uh, religious uh, opposition to, uh, but there's nothing in the uh, the Bible or the Quran that forbids the use of uh, uh, genome editing. Indeed, one can you know draw on. Uh, examples from the Bible, peaceable kingdom of Isaiah, to, to show what one has in mind. Um, in fairness to critics, uh, yeah, one thinks of yeah the, the the eugenics movement, which started off with a whole bunch of good intentions and ended up uh, with all manners uh, manner of uh, horrors uh, in the kind of third right, the euthanasia. Uh, uh, program uh, and 
yeah, I think a lot of people with a good historical memory in the West uh, will be thinking things will go wrong. Uh, and things will go wrong. I mean, this is why uh, essentially exhaustive discussion, risk benefit analysis is, 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 is going to be critical. Um, but yeah, as I said, if, <laughs> if we're not actually prepared to tackle the biological genetic roots of the problem, suffering will go on indefinitely. And yeah, that's why we really need a, a, a debate as a, as a society. Uh, though there are transhumanist organizations, effective altruist organizations, they are quite small, still relatively marginal. I personally think uh, that we need the equivalent of a greater Thunberg, and I'm mispronouncing her name, sorry, uh, to harangue the World Health Organization uh, to live up to its responsibilities. I, I think, yeah, there should be vigorous lobbying of the WHO because, yes, yeah, setting out this, this wonderful vision of what health entails, yeah, uh, the only way to do it uh, uh, it, it, it is genome editing, uh, germline engineering, a biohappiness uh, a, a revolution. Uh, and yeah, uh, in practice, I suspect some mega influencer, some charismatic uh, billionaire is probably going to make the, co the cause their own. It would be wonderful if Ray Kurzweil decided that, uh, as I said, if, if, if I had uh, Ray's flair, you know, I wish I could say 2045, the world's last unpleasant experience or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, in practice, it's going to take strong, charismatic, uh, powerful, rich people to take the vision forward. Uh, I'm really a writer who can force himself to talk a bit. Uh, it's not going to be me who leads the shock troops of the revolution to, to victory. Uh, I, I wish things were otherwise. And speaking of, of your role in this, uh, as we start to wrap up here, is there anything that you're currently working on that you would like to let people know about or share a little bit about? Mm -hmm. Well, I have the draft of uh, a book uh, that's going to be coming out, The Biohappiness uh, Revolution, uh, covering some of the themes we've discussed uh, and others. My original motherload website, headweb.com, H-E-D-W-E-B, <laughs> headweb.com, H-E-D-W-E-B.com, state-of-the-art web design 1997. Uh, still ha has uh, a, a lot of uh, material there. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone uh, who feels that I have avoided all, courts, all, all kinds of difficult questions, feel free to drop me a line, David, headweb.com, or perhaps we can have a follow-up episode. But I just wanted to thank you, uh, Steve, for inviting me on the show. Uh, and uh, yeah, very much appreciated. Yeah, of course. Thank you, David. I really appreciate all these wonderful insights.